Hello and welcome to today's KDP Universities at Home with Wayne Stinnett. I'm Tricia, your host for today, and for the past five years I've moved around Amazon's books teams uh, learning the business so I could share it with authors. But we're here to talk to Wayne Stinnett. He's an American novelist and veteran of the U.S. Marine Corps. Wayne has worked many different jobs, including fisherman, dive master, and deckhand, which inspired him to write Sea Adventures. Wayne lives on one of the sea islands of South Carolina's Low Country with his wife and their youngest daughter. But his life crew also includes three grown children, four grandchildren, a Carolina dog, and a flock of parakeets. Welcome, Wayne. Hi, Tricia. Can you? Am I back on here now? You are back on. I saw you may have had a little bit of difficulties earlier. Kind of dropped yeah. off for a minute, didn't you? Hurricane Zeta and 2020 are conspiring against us. <laughs> <laughs> you're also in the low country, so you're getting the wind gusts too, right? We are. We are. I've, I've been watching Halloween decorations fly by all morning. Well, if you see a witch fly by, it might be real. <laughs> We're getting close. <laughs> You never know. <laughs> all right. Well, first of all, I always want to make sure that um, I thank you for your military service. I know that that's a sacrifice. Um, so I much. appreciate your service to our country. Thank um, you so much. You're welcome. All right. So let's start out with a little bit of background. Um, I always want to ask when you decided that being an author is your calling. Uh, well, it really started a long, long time ago when I was just a little kid. I was one of those nerds that walked around with a, a pencil and a notepad, jotting down notes and ideas and drawing pictures and stuff. And but uh, I started writing seriously in the late '80s and sent uh, a collection of. I wrote a whole bunch of short stories, all, all with the same character, Jesse McDermott, who's the main character in my novels today. Uh -huh. And I sent the three best short stories to 20 some publishers. Oh, wow. And I got uh, seven rejections and the rest of them just ignored me. Oh. And uh, most of them just agreed that I should stick to my day job. So <laughs> that's basically what I did. Uh, continued so with my regular job and life happened and then uh, the internet came along and uh, Amazon and K KDP and the rest is history. So when did you find um, self-publishing in KDP? Uh, so 2013, uh -huh. uh, my, my stepdaughter and son-in-law gave me a Kindle for Chris, no, not Christmas, Father's Day. Uh -huh. And uh, being a truck driver, I was used to, you know, going into the truck stop taking my paperback that I'd finished reading and swapping it out with it for another paperback. They have little mm -hmm. kiosks and some truck stops where you can do that. And uh, that was a whole lot more convenient. I could carry one book and it had all of my books in it. Right. And he, he actually worked for Amazon at the time. And uh, I said, I threw out the idea, Hey, I'd like to write a book one day. He said, well, do it. Every, everybody does it. It's uh Indie publishing, self-publishing. I said, really? So one thing led to another, and I, I started writing a book in uh, June of 2013. And I wrote straight through from the beginning to the end. Never went back and reread it or anything. <laughs> uploaded it to KDP and click publish. <laughs> that was uh, that was the start. And then I learned you needed an editor. <laughs> 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 That's a good call out. How'd you learn that? I'm guessing uh, people's reviews. feedback. Reviews. <laughs> yeah, reviews. The reviews were, most of the reviews were great story, now learn to write, which is pretty much what my uh, uh, creative writing teacher in high school said the same thing. <laughs> well, good to know that you can start with a story. So my question is, have you gone back and rewrote that story that you originally published? Uh, that one has been probably it's already on the second edition, but each it's the first edition was re-uploaded several times. I, I hired a, a friend of mine whose wife was a retired English teacher to be my first editor. 
and she actually printed it out and then used a red ink pen and <laughs> made highlights all through the 300 pages and, and then FedExed it back to me. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was, uh, it was quite an experience, a great learning experience. So I think one of the questions that we get most often from beginner authors is how do you find that editor? So to you, you found a friend whose uh, you know, wife was a former English teacher. Uh, do you still stick with that person or have you found a different editor since then? No, uh, since then I've gone, I went to a professional editor that I found on K-Boards, Eliza D and then uh, Tammy Labreck, and now I use Marsha Zinberg. Uh, she's, uh, Marsha has 30 years experience. She's one of, she was the uh, editorial director at uh, Harper, I think. I could be wrong. If I'm wrong, Marsha, I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, I've also added, you know, a, a, a very large beta team, uh, mostly old friends who aren't afraid to insult me, and a lot of, uh, technical people who are experts in my my character. He, he's got a boat, several boats, and an airplane. So mm -hmm. whenever I have to go, whenever he has to fly somewhere, I write. And then Jesse got in the plane, insert stuff here, and then Jesse got out of the plane. <laughs> and I have my pilots fill in the rest. Nice. So let's talk about how you built that team, because I think that that's the biggest um, kind of stumper for some of the new authors is, is how you build that team, how you find those individuals to help you do exactly, you know, the subject matter experts on boats or planes or um, whatever you may have. It's a, very, it's a very slow process and it really needs to be a slow process. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't want to just invite all your Facebook friends to be beta readers. Um, I look for specifically people who had knowledge of uh, flying, knowledge of big boats, 100 ton license captains and up. Um, one of my beta readers is the owner of the Long Rifle Institute in uh, uh, San Diego. Uh, my main character is a former Marine sniper. I was in the Marine Corps, but I was motor transport. We're not the pride, but without us, the pride don't ride. There you go. Uh, but the, uh, the 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 sharp, pointy end of the spear, the recon snipers, these guys, I have a you know a little bit of knowledge of that, just enough to get by. But I rely real heavily on my on small unit tactics. That comes directly from my beta readers. So, how long did it take you to build up this team that you're currently using? I just added a new one a couple of days ago. Okay. <laughs> it's a continuing process. Uh, mm -hmm. I started out with uh, about four or five close friends, and uh, then it started growing from there. And I, I never asked anybody, but somebody would read my books and they would email me and say, "Hey, I, you, uh, it's a great story, and every, I loved everything about it, except this, and you made this mistake." And so I invite them to be a beta reader. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that seems to have worked out pretty well so far. Good. So with the beta readers and the editors, um, how much of the story is still yours versus how much feedback you take from other, um, other people during your process? Uh, probably 99, 99%. Uh, my beta readers don't change a whole lot. They point out more than anything else. I, I tell them to ignore typos, ignore grammar, because that's what my editor's for. Right. What they're looking for are holes in the plot. They're because it takes three or four months to write a story, uh -huh. and you know eight or ten hours to read it. And a lot of times in the beginning, I'll send Jesse off on you know down this rabbit hole or something, and forget about it. And they'll read it and say, hey, what about that rabbit hole? You got to go back and fix that. And so it's not so much that they're adding or changing the story, mm -hmm. but they're making sure that I didn't forget something. Or a lot of times I might repeat something and uh, they, they take care of that. And it's important to read it, read the whole story through 
start to finish in one sitting. Uh-huh. And, uh huh. That that takes care of a lot of the problems, but uh, having the beta readers is is really really important. Okay, that's really good advice because I know that that's that's a challenge and that's a question that we we get often. Um, now, what genre do you primarily write in? Uh, well, Amazon calls it action adventure, mm -hmm. but if, if if Amazon were to break action and adventure into two different genres, it would be an adventure. Okay. Because I, I used to work in a bar. I was a I was a bouncer for a while. And I know that the what you see on TV when two guys get in a fight and they trade punches for 15 minutes, that's not reality. The reality <laughs> is the fight lasts about 30 seconds, one person gets hit and it's over. And that's the way that's the way a that's the way reality is. Uh -huh. So I try to keep to that as much as I can. And it's, it, I don't know, it's, it's, it just comes out a little bit, a little bit different than it's not really action. Uh -huh. It's more, it's more the adventure side. Most of my books start out with Jesse standing in knee deep water, casting a fly rod. <laughs> and it's kind of, for most people it would, they would find that quite boring, but uh, my readers seem to enjoy it. And the sea adventure genre is growing like unbelievably fast. Oh, good. Good. Now, that's not the only genre you write in. You have another book, is that correct? That's nonfiction. Yes. Uh, Blue Collar, No Collar. I wrote uh, in 2016 or 2017, mm -hmm. as right after I uh, went over this uh, seven digit mark in income. And basically, it's an outline of what I did, how I did it, a few tips, but mostly it's a, a motivational. Um, to, a lot of people have said that they've toyed with the idea. They've Over the years, they've written several chapters, and they don't know where, where to go from there. And then they found, my, found that book and uh, read it and got the, uh, the inspiration they needed from it. And it's, it, I wrote it as if I'm sitting on a bar stool, sitting next to somebody and just telling them, telling them a story, of how, how to do this and how to do that and what I did and what I, what mistakes I made. And, uh, the mistakes are the biggest part because everybody's going to make mistakes. And if you can avoid the mistakes that I made early on, you'll do a lot better. <laughs> okay. So let's talk about a couple of those mistakes. I'll let you take a sip of your coffee. I know. This could be. Uh, actually, I was going to refill it. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I'll give you a minute to go ahead and do that. But yeah, the, the first mistake is definitely have somebody else read your story before you publish it. <laughs> <laughs> and the more, the better. There you go. So what other tips do you have for new authors coming in. I think the other thing that uh, authors may struggle with is finding the right categories. Would you agree with that? Uh, yeah, from what I've heard. Um, mm -hmm. I can't say that that was a mistake on my part because I started reading a lot uh, when I was when I was a kid. You know, I read the, you know, the Hardy Boys mysteries. Mm -hmm. But then around 14, I discovered John D. McDonald in the Travis McGee series. And John D. wrote 21 books in that series with a uh, main character who lived on a boat in South Florida. And uh, he took his retirement in small chunks. And mm -hmm. uh, after that, I, I was hooked. At 16, I, when I got my driver's license, the very first road trip I made was to Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I went to Bahia Mar Marina. And I was walking up and down the docks looking for slip F-18 and the busted flush. And so the, the dock master came out and saw me. He said, he said, can I help you with something? I said, well, I'm looking for slip F-18, but all these slips are have numbers. There's no letters. And he just kind of <laughs> shook his head and said, son, Travis McGee's not a real person. And I was like, ah, oh. it just shattered my world. I was 16 years old. Right. And then I went on from there and started reading uh, Randy Wayne White, James Hall, uh, Carl Hyacin, Elmore Leonard. The, there's a whole gamut of South Florida writers. Uh -huh. And one by one, I 
I read them all. I was waiting for John D's next book. I was waiting for Randy's next book. And uh, I make I make no uh, no secret of the fact that anything that Randy Wayne White does is what Wayne Stennett does because Randy's very successful. And my dad always told me, if you want to be successful, do what successful people do. Uh-huh. Randy did a spinoff with, uh, about three years ago with uh, his main character's girlfriend is the main character, Hannah Smith. And so I immediately jumped into my list of characters and I'm looking for a female character with the right qualities. And uh, then the Charity Style series came out. So I follow Randy's footsteps religiously. Okay. <laughs> Good. So let's talk a little bit uh, about marketing. That's another area that I think everybody want, has questions about. You know, how do you find that reader base? And then once you find that reader base, how do you keep them engaged? I started a, uh, a newsletter mailing list real early on. I think after I published the second book and my first newsletter went to nine people and six of them bought the next book. So I thought, mm -hmm. oh, this, this is a pretty good idea. And I, I actually take a different route than most authors do. Most authors, you know, they, they have a, a giveaway to entice people to sign up for their newsletters. And that's, I don't know if it works or not, how well it works. I don't know because that's not what I do. I have at the end of my book, I have an invitation to join the mailing list, but no mm -hmm. link. I have a link to my website. So they click that link, they go to my website, they click the link to join the mailing list, and then they have to provide, you know, their email address, and then it automatically sends them an email to confirm. So it's it's actually quite difficult to become uh, a subscriber to my mailing list, and that's what I want. I want just those core people who aren't interested in getting a free a free chapter or a free book or anything. I just want the people who, the readers who like my books and want to be the very first person to buy the next one and are interested in what I do, how I do it, and I email them at least once a month mm -hmm. and uh, just to keep them up, up to speed on what's going on. Interesting. Yeah, that's that's very different than a lot of other authors that we hear. So I'm guessing that it kind of keeps your mailing list a little smaller than maybe some other authors, but they're the people, to your point, that are really engaged. Yep. Uh, uh, my mailing list is less than 7,000. And going back seven years, that's only 1,000 a year. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't do the math in my head, but it's less than 100 a month. And that's, okay. you know, I, I get one, two, three subscribers a day on the yeah. average day. And that's what I want. I, I don't want, I don't want a whole lot of people cluttering up and let's face it, it costs money. Mm -hmm. um, if you're on MailChimp or MailerLite or any of these other platforms, it's based on how many subscribers you have. Mm -hmm. and if you've got 25,000 subscribers, you're paying $150, $200 a month. And you're getting a read read rate of 10 or 15 percent, and a click click rate of less than that. Mm -hmm. My my open rate is above 60 percent every time, and my click rate. I always recommend other authors' books, so my click rate is always in the 50 percent or higher range. So getting a higher return on investment. Exactly, and it's just these are. These are the people, these are the readers who really, really want to know what's going on. They're not waiting for the next free thing. Okay. What other marketing tools do you use? Do you use social media? Do you, you know, what kind of, talk me through a launch of a book, one of your books. What kind of marketing do you do for a new launch? Uh, marketing, not really any for a new launch. Uh, okay. I release it to, uh, I let my, uh, subscribers know, uh -huh. and I make I make a post on Facebook, and that's about it. I don't do any advertising. Uh, I advertise the first book primarily, the first first book in each series mm -hmm. through uh, AMS and Facebook ads, mm -hmm. and they keep enough people coming into the series to where 
once they once they've read, you know, I, the next book is the 19th book in the series. So <laughs> nobody, I can't advertise the 19th book. Who's going to read the 19th book first? Nobody. Right. But uh, they will read the first. So uh -huh. I keep advertising the first book, and it continues to sell uh, anywhere from 10 to 20 per day. Gotcha. That's, that's my my goal. Just keep that level at, at a nice 10 to 20 per day and uh -huh. that brings in new readers new subscribers and every launch is slightly higher than that the previous one right now you are not just books right you have merchandise that's related to your books is that correct yes we uh we sell t-shirts i'm i'm wearing one now this is a uh, which one am i wearing Rusty anchor. rusty anchor uh, the Rusty Anchor is a fictional place in Marathon in the Florida Keys. Uh -huh. it's, uh, it's a locals only kind of hangout where fishermen gather and fishing guides. And uh, it's situated in a place where it's really hard to find, kind of like my newsletter, the <laughs> owner, Rusty, Rusty Thurman. He doesn't have a big sign out front. There's no arrows and neon lights or anything like that. There's just an old rusted mailbox out front. And then you have to drive through a kind of meandering uh, crushed shell driveway to get to it. Uh -huh. uh, but the Rusty Anchor, and this, we, we sell these uh, uh, big posters also, and coffee mugs. This is the Gaspar's Revenge. That's uh, Gaspar's Revenge is the name of my main character's primary fishing vessel, a 45-foot mm -hmm. uh, Rampage convertible. And we sell, uh, well, the T-shirts are the big sellers. We also sell autographed paperbacks, uh, tote bags, which we call boat bags, mm -hmm. and uh, grilling aprons because, you know, I like to smoke meat. So. <laughs> You're in South Carolina. Everybody, you yeah, have to. Everybody smokes meat, yeah. There you go. <laughs> But so yeah, we just you, we just sell a bunch of stuff, and it's it's fun. Uh huh. Why did you make that decision to diversify from just not your books, but also into that merchandise? What why why did you make that decision to do that? Reader's interest. Uh huh. And more than more than anything, we, I, I got emails from people who said, you know, is do you do you sell anything related to your books? I, uh -huh. No, I don't. I just sell my books. You know. And I got enough of them to where I realized there's probably a pretty good interest here and we might be able to make a little bit of money. And uh, so I, I gave it to my, my daughter, Jordan, who's behind the camera. And she's uh, she's run the ship store now for four or five years. Uh -huh. And uh, she's she's done quite well at it. She uh, When she turned 16, she bought a, a Jeep Wrangler, brand new. Wow. And it's uh it's become a, a just a, a passive income it's we do it through a an or a, a website called print aura i don't know if i'm allowed to plug anybody is that, that okay yeah okay print, print aura is like print aura is for t-shirts what kdp is for books mm -hmm. or kdp print is for books it's print on demand you set up you set up your merchandise set up your logos the way you want and that's and you put it on your website and then when somebody sees it and wants to buy it they click on buy and the money that they pay goes directly into our bank account and the order goes to print aura and print aura debits our bank account the wholesale price leaving the profit mm -hmm. and then they ship directly to the customer with our return address and shipping shipping label and so it's completely passive there's very little input required every now and then an order gets hung up but for the most part, uh, it just does its own thing and we don't even have to work with it. Nice. So it's nice to have that diversify, you know, to, to be able to diversify the, the income because with self-publishing, it's not guaranteed, right? You see ebbs and flows. Yeah. And it, it's just a, it's, it's a fun passive way of making a little bit of extra money. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's nothing, you're not going to get rich off of it. I think our best month was, Two months ago, we made about $500. Uh -huh. uh, normal months are around $90 to $100, something like that. But it's, you know, every little bit helps. And it pays okay. for a new Jeep. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> nice. 
Well, we've got lots of questions coming in. So if you're ready for it, let's take some questions from attendees. Oh, big um, fire away. All right. Um, oh, give me a second. Let me find a few. Um, oh, we won't. I think we got a lot of feedback when, when you dropped off for a minute. So I've got to scroll through that. <laughs> so uh, we have a question around how many books that you sell per title on average? Um, well, that's, that's difficult to, let's see if I can estimate it. I can't give you yeah. exact numbers. Don't give me I'm exact, I don't office. want exact numbers, yeah. <laughs> The first book, anywhere from 10 to 20 per day. Okay. And after that, it drops. It's, my sell-through rate is about 50% from book one to book 18. Gotcha. And uh, Well, and that's not exactly true. It kind of goes down like this and then back up. Because the, the latest one, it was released on August 31st. It's still selling 20 plus per day. Uh -huh. uh, right after the right after release, it was selling anywhere from 200 to 400 a day, and uh, but overall, uh, the middle the middle books, book nine, 10, 11, 12, they're mm -hmm. probably selling four to five a day on average. Gotcha. All right. So you have a book coming out soon, correct? You've, in December, you've got another book coming out? December 21st will be the 19th book in the Jesse series called Rising Moon. And uh, I think, in my opinion, it's probably the best written that I've done yet. I've learned a lot over the years. <laughs> I have no background in creative writing. I took a high school creative writing class, but other than that, that's it. And uh, slowly over the years, I've learned that I've learned how to write grammatically correct sentences. And it's probably the best written and probably the best story so far. It's really, really compelling. And uh, my beta readers have absolutely loved it. Uh, they have nothing bad to say about it, except for Good. all the mistakes. <laughs> Well, that feeds into the next question. Um, Kathleen wants to know how you've improved your writing skills over the years. Is there something you focused on doing or was it just kind of organic and getting that feedback? Getting the feedback from my editor. Uh, when I, the, the first book, like I said, it was printed and red ink and it took days and weeks to go through each page and find it on the <laughs> on the computer, find the same sentence and then make the and now I've I've kind of I'm learning, you know, where commas go. I used to throw commas in just willy nilly at whenever wherever it seemed like a comma ought to be or maybe where it not ought to be. And uh, but my editor has Marsha has uh she's she's got the heart of a teacher. Uh huh. And Rather than just make the correction or just show me the correction, she explains over on a, in a balloon, you know, off on the side, why that is. Uh -huh. The Chicago Manual style says this, you know. Uh, I used to write out numbers, 2,567, T-W-O-T-H-O-U-S. <laughs> and she said, no, anything, anything over, uh, over number 100, as long as it's not a round number, you can use numbers, regular numbers, uh -huh. and little things like that, and where where punctuation should go and where it shouldn't go, and uh, little by little, I, I learned the craft, or not the craft, but the art of writing. Mm -hmm. The craft, I think, is something you're you're born with, the the ability to tell a story, and to tell a compelling story from beginning to end, and keep to keep the reader's attention. It's something. Some people are just born with. Some people can learn it. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be born with it. I can I can sit here and tell stories all day long. Uh -huh. Of course, my, my family will leave the room. But <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So we have a question about your beta readers. Now, um, your beta readers, is that a paid position or is that something that people do just to get that first um, first look at the new book? They, they're uh, an integral part of my team, but uh, they don't, they're not, they're not paid monetarily. Um, they all get a free signed copy of uh, the paperback when, once it comes out and uh, they're mentioned in the forward. Uh, other than that, uh, they just do it because they want to help me succeed. Gotcha. And it, they're a huge part of my success. Mm -hmm. Your covers. So we have a couple questions about your covers, whether you design those or if you have somebody on your team that designs your covers. I have a cover designer. Uh, her name is Shane Rutherford. Shane, I provide the photograph. Uh -huh. All of my covers are, are, are actual photos. There's very little that she has to do to touch them up. Well, one of them, uh, Fallen, Fallen Honor, has a picture of a boat on the cover. Uh -huh. And the actual picture, the boat had a tuna tower mounted up above. It's a higher higher helm station and my my character's boat doesn't have a tuna tower so she had to digitally go in and erase that and oh, that, that okay. was that was that's that's the extent of the airbrushing or whatever it is she does but she takes the picture and crops it centers it and puts the words on it and basically gotcha. that's that's it okay so mike wants to know how you choose your titles um, early on, the titles came to me while writing. The, the mm -hmm. first book I wrote was Fallen Palm, which is now the second book in the series. Originally, it was titled Link's Key Rain, R-E-I-G-N. And it wasn't until I wrote the very last paragraph. There was, a, there was a palm tree on my main character's island. It was right in the center of the island. Everything around it was cleared. And... One of his friends said that, hey, this would make a great helicopter LZ if it wasn't for that palm tree. And he started working with this group, and uh, one thing led to another. And at the end of the book, Jesse cuts down the palm tree. And so, uh, wow, that's a perfect name, Fallen Palm. And then Jordan, who was, how old were you then, 10? She, did, she said, I, I needed branding, so I needed to keep one of those words in the title. Uh-huh. So the second book was Fallen Hunter, and then Fallen Pride, and then Fallen Mangrove, and it just kept on until we ran out of words for that we could put with Fallen that would make sense. So we switched over to Rising, and then we had Rising Storm, Rising Fury, Rising Force, and uh, we had 10 Fallen books, and there will be 10 Rising books, and then that will be the end of the Rising part of it, and the 21st book which will match John D. McDonald's 21st, 21 books in the Travis McGee series will be titled Steady As She Goes. And that may or may not be the end of the Jesse series. I haven't <laughs> decided yet. I, a part of me doesn't want to go beyond that. Uh, uh -huh. I mean, John McDonald was such an integral part of my life growing up. And just out of respect for the storyteller, I don't want to go, I don't want to go beyond, beyond that. Right. But I think Jesse needs to. <laughs> so I'm kind of torn. I don't know which way to go. Gotcha. And I think that that's kind of a struggle for uh, all authors who write serial content is the, the fact that, you know, do you end it when the story tells itself out, right? Especially exactly. if there's still demand for it. You, you don't want to jump the shark. <laughs> you know, that's... Anybody that's as old as I am knows that, I mean, you, you, you hear that term all the time, don't jump the shark. But it goes back to the TV show Happy Days when Fonzie, Arthur Fonzarelli, actually jumped his motorcycle across a shark. And that was the end of Happy Days. I mean, they, it, didn't, it didn't work after that. Right. So I, I don't know how long the series will be. Uh, I'm coming out with uh, a new co-written uh, series, the Jerry Snyder series, and uh, that's with uh, Stuart Matthews, 
-hmm. And Stuart and I spent the last year, well, it's, it's almost a full year since we came up with the idea. And that will be published uh, sometime between December and April. We had, had got fitted into the schedule. But uh, it, I, I can see that becoming the, the primary series later on. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, But Jesse is, you know, he was, he enlisted in the Marine Corps in 1979, two years after I did. So he's two years younger than me. Now, how many super or action adventure heroes look like this? You know, <laughs> old, fat, bald, and gray. Jesse's tall. He's handsome. He's got a full head of hair. There's a little bit of gray in his beard. He's fit. He's active. Uh -huh. But he's 58, he's 58 years old. So there has to be a, I mean, there has to be a limit to an action hero's longevity. Right. Right. Before he passes the torch to someone else. Before you jump the shark. <laughs> right. <laughs> and you can't have a 65. Well, in my latest book, he repels out of a helicopter with one of his friends who is 70 years old. And people say, well, that's not possible. You can't be that age and still be that kind. Oh, yeah, you can. And yeah. There are people out there who can do it. Right. They've kept themselves not, fit. Not and everybody. <laughs> not everybody can do it. I certainly can't. Right. But I'm not a recon marine. I'm just a writer. <laughs> <laughs> we have a, a question about um, how you navigated the KDP process when you first started. Uh, well, it was in the back of a truck. I was a truck driver at the time. Okay. And I had to find a, a, a spot in the truck stop that was close to the Wi-Fi antenna to be able to upload. And by and large, most of the time, the upload was interrupted about, you know, halfway through as the truck drove in front of me. And early on, I actually formatted my books that way. I would upload it, open the look inside, scroll to the, you know, the second chapter. And if four lines of chapter one were on the same page. I'd go back to the manuscript, add four lines. I didn't know anything about page breaks at the time. Right. I'd add four lines, re-upload it, and do it all over again. And uh, the KDP has come a long, long way since then. You can actually have the formatting done right there. Uh, you can hire a formatter to do it for you, or you can learn the formatting. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I prefer to hire people to do the things that other than writing, uh -huh. because it frees me up to write more. Right. So, uh, I have I have a an author assistant organization now, and they take care of my AMS ads. They take care of my publishing. They they take care of basically everything except the writing. And uh, then my formatter does the formatting and cover designers. And I just write the story, and when it's done, I send it to the next person. And but in the early days with KDP, it it was you know it was it was a learning process. I had I, I didn't I'm not tech savvy. I'm a tech neophyte, and uh, that's why I'm sitting here on in front of the camera, and my daughter's sitting on the other side of the camera. <laughs> <laughs> she sets all this technical stuff up for me. But it was uh, I had to learn a lot in the, in the early days because I was the only one doing it. I was I was doing the writing, the editing, the formatting, or trying to. I designed my first uh, three covers myself, which have long since gone away because they're really horrendous. <laughs> and, but it, it's it's a long learning curve, but it's mm -hmm. doable. And that's the that's the thing. Most writers are are creative types, and mm -hmm. creative type people aren't really tech savvy. Uh, and then you have people who are tech savvy, who, you know, couldn't draw a stick figure. And sometimes there's a merging of those two. And right. that's that's what the ideal writer would be somebody who is, has a technical background, a sales background, a marketing background, and learns how to write. <laughs> um, so. 
I think we've got some people that are wondering kind of the timeline. You you say this is a slow process, and I hate to to force you to put a number around it, but would you say you know it took you three years, four years to be able to t make that transition from doing this part time to a full time writer? I, w I was very lucky. I was extremely fortunate. Um, what I write is exactly what I like to read. Mm -hmm. And South Florida Sea Adventures, that's all I read. So when I started writing, it it just came naturally. Uh -huh. And so the, the timeline for it, at the time, I would write the book and then start on the process of publishing. Now I have scheduled releases on December 21st, April 26th, August 20th, and again in this late December. And then Steady As She Goes will be in April of 2022. So I have this all on a schedule now. I know right. exactly how many, I, I know what I can do. I know I can write a certain pace, a certain number of words per day, a certain number of words per week. My apologies if you're picking up the jet noise. We live right outside Marine Corps Air Station Buford, and it's an F-35 lightning flying over right now. <laughs> but I know when I'm going to write. I know when I'm not going to write. And I, I wish I had a nickel for every time a writer said, well, I would have got it finished, except Christmas just snuck up on me. Well, Christmas is on December 25th every year. It doesn't sneak around. It's always there. So don't schedule that week for writing because you're not going to. Right. Be realistic about it. You're not going to write on your child's fifth birthday. You're not going to write on your 20th anniversary. You're not going to write during your 18-year-old's graduation, Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, all these holidays. So create a schedule. Put in all those times when you're not going to write and then fill in the time that you are going to write. Mm -hmm. And that, that will allow you to predict exactly when the book's going to be finished and when it's going to go to the editor. Because guess what? The editor has a backlog, too. Right. And the last thing you want to do is write the end and call your editor and say, hey, when can you do this? And they say in about four months. <laughs> but if you schedule that time ahead, then you say, OK, I'm finished. Here you go. And it's off to the races. So Jackie wants to know what form of book sells best for you, digital, paper, or audio? We haven't talked much about audio. By far, digital. And I think that's mostly because uh, as indie authors, we don't really have access to the big bookstores. Uh, Barnes & Noble, all the mom and pop stores, um, and we don't have somebody pushing those paperbacks to these stores. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the stores are loaded with books. They just don't have a whole lot of indie authors published. And so the my ebooks are probably 90%, 85 to 90% of my gross. Audiobooks are a solid 10% and paperbacks are around 7 or 8%. I don't know if are that you? adds up to 100 or not, but I'm just estimating. <laughs> Are you are you seeing an increase in audiobook popularity? Yes, audiobooks are definitely on the rise. Uh, when I first started in 2015, it took uh, about six or eight months for the first audiobook to earn back the investment, and it is a big investment. It's going to cost a couple thousand dollars to record an audiobook, but uh, it, and now the my latest audiobook. Uh, was released the same time as the paperback and the ebook on August 31st, mm -hmm. and it earned it. It earned out its expense uh, earlier this month. It's just about oh, wow. six weeks, five or six weeks. But okay. uh, it's the the audiobook is definitely growing. People are finding that they have all this time when they're just you know driving down the road listening to rock and roll or jazz or country music or whatever, mm -hmm. and We've been doing that all our lives, but wouldn't it be cool to listen to a story while you're doing that daily commute, you know, two hours or an hour or 30 minutes or whatever? 
Right. My wife listens to audiobooks while she's cooking. And, you know, from six o'clock, I don't go in the kitchen because, you know, she's got an audiobook playing and I don't want to interrupt the story. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. When, when you're mowing the grass or, uh -huh. or anything that doesn't involve the brain. Right. Obviously, you can't write a story and listen to an audiobook. That's impossible. Uh, right. You can't. You can't write music. You can't play music. You can't. A lot of things you can't do while listening to an audio book. But anything that doesn't require your brain that your hands can do automatically. If you're if you're a woodworker and you're in your shop and you're turning a turning a table leg or something like that. Yeah, you could have an audio book going. Put your ear pods on. Just, you know, be careful. You don't cut your finger off. And, <laughs> but there's. Audiobooks are really, really coming on strong. I would say they're going to be competing directly against ebooks in 2022 or 2023 as one to one share, market share. Yeah, we do. Um, I know that I have my my earbuds in and while I'm doing anything around the house, it makes my husband crazy because he inevitably ends up sneaking up on me because I don't hear him coming. <laughs> Yeah, I usually when I walk in the room, I just stop and st stand at the door. My wife will be, you know, vacuuming or cleaning the birdcage or whatever. And I'll just stand there and wait until she turns to me. Because if I tap her on the shoulder, she's going to jump out of her skin. <laughs> there you go. Because <laughs> she listens to these mysteries and these, uh -huh. the, and she could be at the, you know, the part where the killer is coming up behind somebody with a knife. <laughs> and then I tap her on the shoulder and she has a heart attack. Right. That's not good. Those, yeah, those I don't want to be responsible for that. There you go. <laughs> exactly. Um, so Jackie wants to know, uh, are you KDP specific or are you published wide? Uh, I was exclusive to KDP for from 2013 until February of this year. Uh, we just started going wide uh, in February mm -hmm. and we now have all our books wide with the exception of the latest release and going forward. Because I don't want to alienate my Kate, my uh, Kindle Unlimited readers. They're, right. they're, they've been they've been supporting me for you know seven years. So going forward, new releases go into Kindle Unlimited for nine, one ninety day period, and then they go wide. So that that enables the readers. We took them out in order, starting mm -hmm. with the first book, and then we did the first two books in February, and then March was one or two, April and just slowly pulled them out and published them wide until we got to the end. And that's where we are now, just waiting for the uh, the latest release to reach its 90 day and then it, it will go wide. But uh, it's, it's not making, it's not a dollar for dollar, uh, they're not equal. Uh, right. I earned a lot more through KU, uh, but it's, I, I just wanted to try it. I, I'm not, I'm not sold 100% on why it is the way to go. I'm not one of these, you know, conspiracy theorists that you can't put all your eggs in one basket. I just want to, I just want to try things new. Uh -huh. And I reached a point where sales on Amazon alone could float my boat. And once I reached that point, I, okay, well, if I don't need that, K, that Kindle Unlimited income, I can try something new. So. Right. We branched out and uh, it's it's doing okay. Um, where uh, Kate, where Kindle Unlimited was 50% of my gross income, it's dropped down to where it's now like 5% because I still have the new book. Mm -hmm. And the wide distribution needs to be above 15% to make it uh, competitive. And right now it's at about 6%. So gotcha. it's got it's got it's got a ways to go, and we're still experimenting with ideas, and uh, it's it's a long process. But the nice thing about it is you can try it. If it works, you stick with it. If it doesn't work, you go it back. Work, you go right back in. Right. I, I would advise anybody just starting out. Definitely, Kindle Unlimited is the way to go because you have the marketing tools that you don't have if you're not in select. Uh, you have a large audience. Um, when when a book is priced like five ninety nine or four ninety nine, the royalties from that would equal 
five people reading the entire book in KU. Mm -hmm. So it's a one to five or one to six ratio. And getting getting that to that audience, that huge audience, that's it's a really big audience. And getting and the each time it's downloaded on KU counts exactly as a sale in so far as rank. So if you have one person buying it and five people borrowing it, that that's the same as six people buying it or six people borrowing it. And it, the rank, it, it, it's very you're very dependent on a really good rank early on. Uh, now I'm more dependent on my newsletter mm -hmm. with 7,000 subscribers. I know my new release is going to be at least in the top 100, usually in the top 50. My latest one was number 23. Debut oh, wow. Rank. And so, but starting off, you need those, you, you really need that audience. It's very, very important. And the, the marketing tools, being able to do a discount to 99 cents for a certain number of days and still keep that 70% royalty to be able to make it free for so many days. And if you have, I mean, it does no good for a standalone, but if you have a series of three or four books, making that first one free for, you know, a couple of days and getting it into BookBub mm -hmm. and where it's 23,000, 30,000 downloads creates a huge wave of sell through to the, the later books in the series. So did you prefer one of the promotions over the other? Did you use the free promotion more or the, the um, countdown deal when you were in KU? Early on, it was uh, the countdown mm -hmm. and, but since about 2015, it was basically whatever BookBub would take. <laughs> BookBub was such a huge part. I've had uh, about 25 or 26 BookBub feature deals. And a lot of people don't understand the rules. If you apply to BookBub for a discounted deal and they reject it, well, you can apply again for free with the same book right away. You don't have to wait a month so long as it's at a lower price. So I would apply for discounted, rejected, apply for free, go to book two, apply for discounted, free, book three, free, book four. And eventually, I mean, there's really not a day that goes by that BookBub isn't looking at one of my books every mm -hmm. single day because I don't let them. And, and wh whichever one they take, free or discounted, that's that's what I, I, I do for the marketing through KDP. Gotcha. Gotcha. Or did. i got to get used to that idea. i got to manually lower the price. <laughs> yeah, there you go. It's a little bit different now. Yeah. Um, all right. So we have a question about your process, your writing process. Um, and this comes up every time. Are you a pantser or a plotter? A pantser or a plotter. I'm yeah. a pantser. You're a pantser. I, okay. I, I tried to plot a book one time. And I spent three weeks writing the outline and I got about halfway through and just tossed it aside and started writing the book. <laughs> but uh, I do plan a portion of it. I, I plan where the book is going to take place. Mm -hmm. It's the Caribbean adventure series, the Caribbean thriller series, and soon to be the Caribbean mystery series. And so obviously it's going to take place somewhere in the Caribbean or South Florida. So I, I plan the location and I send my main character there and he doesn't always stay there because I'm a pantser and I just follow him. He takes the wheel and guides the ship wherever he wants to go. Uh, my second book was supposed to take place in Key West and Cozumel, Mexico. Uh -huh. Well, it, it ended up in Cuba and that was, I had no plan for that. That's just the way things turned out. So I, I, that's I, that's the only part of it that I plan. Everything else, is, I just, from once upon a time to the end, it's just as it comes out. Okay, good to know. And that's why that's why my beta readers find all these rabbit holes that Jesse missed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's see. We've got time for just one more question. Um. So Bill wants to know, have you bundled any of your books? I think that's yes. a new thing. Okay. Um, books one through four are available in a box set. 
Uh, books five, six, and seven are available in a box set. I also have a box set of eight, nine, and 10, 11, 12, and 13, but I haven't published those. Okay. Uh, it's simply, I, I, I think it takes away a little bit from, because my, my price structure is, uh, I have my first three are at $2.99, the second three are $3.99, next three are $4.99, $5.99, $6.99, up to $7.99. And to bundle, you know, books that are priced at $5.99, I couldn't price it high enough to make a, make a profit over the individual books. And so it's just it's just cost preventative. Okay. But the, yeah, the first four, a lot of people get into the series that way. They buy the first four, and then even though the next three are available in a bundle, they most prefer to go in and buy the individual books. And I know that we're at time, but I do want to get into that pricing structure you just mentioned um, real quick before we end. So okay. you you do with your series, you go up a dollar for each because you retain uh, readers, right? Once they get invested into the reading, you find that they stick with it and they purchase at the higher price? Yes. Uh, not as many. Uh, I, I, I do get some complaints about the higher price, uh, especially if it's uh, most recently there was a mistake on the, the page count and I got 15 or 20 emails from readers saying, I'm not going to pay $7.99 for a 200 page book. I said, what? 200 pages? None of my books are that short. But yeah, um, the, the slowly rising price here, originally it was the first book was $2.99, the second book was $2.99, the third book was $3.99. Uh -huh. And then when I released the fourth one, well, the fourth one was actually the first, so it went to $2.99. I wrote it as a loss leader and was planning to make it perma-free, but never did. And as the series got longer, I made each price tier a little bit longer. And okay. now it's uh, there's I have three books at each price point, and then the, the latest will be added to the top tier of $7.99. I don't okay. think I can go any higher than that. Any, yeah. any more than... You, you get up to $8.99 and $9.99, it's, it's really difficult to retain readers. Right, right. At that price point, they're usually looking for a, a fully color book or, or something mm -hmm. more. Good call out. Well, thank you. So we are definitely at time. We're a little over time, but I figure that can make up for the little hiccup we had early on. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. You had a wealth of information and it was so enjoyable talking to you this morning. Well, thank you for having me on, Tricia. It's been, uh, it's been a great pleasure and I really enjoyed it. Wonderful. All right. Just a reminder to everybody who's joining us. Again, we will post the recording of today's session on our YouTube channel later today. And then tomorrow you'll receive that follow-up email that has the link to the recording on YouTube and also a link to our help pages where you can find all of our upcoming sessions. But thank you so much for joining us and as always, happy publishing.